pictures, you think you're doing a big commercial project, but if you follow your nose and follow the themes of the, of the film, it could be extremely not. It could be very... In fact, Brando knew. I had a deal with Brando to come in at the end for three weeks. And when he, he was a very sharp man, without a doubt. And he looked at me and he says, well, you painted yourself in a corner, haven't you? Which I had, because the movie going up the river had gotten so full of red, green, blue, and yellow smoke and strange imagery and surrealism that a normal battle scene at the end, like a typical World War II movie, what wouldn't be appropriate? And I, and I didn't know what would be appropriate, you know, in fact. Uh, so, so the irony is that the movie took on its own life, became stranger and more surreal, and, 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 and in, in a sense it went the direction, I think, correct for that issue because uh, uh, the Vietnam War was a, was a very strange, it was a West Coast war, it had drugs and rock and roll and surfing and, and uh, West Coast characters and what have you. Uh, so it wasn't like the typical uh, war, and it wasn't like the typical war film. But basically, in answer to your question, nobody wanted to finance it, nobody wanted to be in it. And because I stuck up, I was young, I stuck up what I had earned on The Godfather to guarantee it, uh, we made it, and, and, and then over the years, I turned out that I owned it. <laughs> That's a good thing. A good um, thing. And a good lesson. Um, so, the, you've been very, there's a really wonderful interview that you did with John Milius that exists on the DVD about the script, and you're, you're very, um, you're very gracious about the fact that, you know, this was John's sort of conception. I love when people say, oh, I love that line, or I love that moment. I love to always tell the truth as, as best I can remember as where it came from. And all of the great lines from this movie uh, come from John Mirius. I love the smell of napalm in the morning, or, you know, any number of, uh, of the, the idea of the helicopters playing the Wagner. John Milius. John Milius' script uh, you know, really was the first script of this, and, 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 and some of these uh, memorable scenes come from here. And so, at, at this point, when you're trying, you're trying to get this set up, you realize there's no studio that wants to finance this. You decide you're going to finance it independently, and you... <laughs> The, the, the United States government and the military are not going to support you. Yeah, Donald Rumsford was the, the DOD and he totally turned out we were to get no cooperation. He was the uh, Secretary of Defense twice and this was the first time. Right, so you've got to, so you're now, I think there are a lot of people who go like, oh my God, you know, you went to the Philippines and you dealt with this autocrat, but there wasn't any other move. You needed American equipment to make this movie. Yeah, all of those helicopters, all of that hardware uh, was, was because the Philippine Army had it. Right, and there. But they were fighting uh, an insurrection in uh, Mindanao. So every, every time we were shooting, often when we were shooting, we'd have, I don't know, whatever it was, 20, 25 helicopters. they just get up and leave. And so where are they going? And they say, well, you know, the problem, was that, <laughs> the problem was that all of the entire Philippine helicopter force was right there with us, and so anyone who wanted to blow it up, they were, they were all sitting ducks. So every once in a while they would just go away. I mean, there were a lot of, uh, you know, my wife made a fascinating documentary. You know, I wanted to treat my wife in the Philippines. children with me, Sophia was there, and uh, all my children, and, and I wanted my wife to stay because I wanted her company, so I gave her a, uh, a, a camera, uh, an Eclair 16mm camera, and said, why don't you just shoot all the behind the scenes, and, and she did it really well, she's a very good uh, handheld uh, camera person, but, but it was a little bit of a trick of my part to, to try to have my wife stay with me. And, and so I would come back, if you see her film, I would come
back from the shoot, and I would come back and say, oh, this is the worst film ever made. I'm going to get an F for this movie. This movie is, I'm never going to survive this. And, and hoping she'd say, oh, no, dear, it's going to be wonderful. Music. Instead, she would say, oh, let me get the microphone on you. Would you say that again? <laughs> so, 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 but the, the, her film really, the, and her notes, because they are what she actually was writing, really give a perspective. Uh, uh, her film is called Hearts of Darkness. It could have easily been called Watch the Dances Suck. <laughs> well, that brings up an interesting thing, which is in going back through all the supplementary materials on the movie that are available, everything was documented. I, I was kind of stunned by the fact that it seemed like every stage of this process was being documented by somebody. The music, the sound mix, the edit. And I, was that normal then? Or did you say, we should do this? Because it seems to me, I would never let people do that. Like, shoot me. What Talking about what I want to do is like my worst nightmare. But th this... This, this seems to be the best documented production I've ever seen. Our little company didn't have much money at that period, uh, and I knew that the cinema was going to basically become electronic or digital, as you were. I knew that based on working on this picture. I knew that there's got to be another way to do this other than actually flying 25 helicopters with guys in and shoot at them and have them crash and blow. Because everything you see in the picture, we really did. There's no effects whatsoever uh, that, that we use. So I knew what was coming, but we couldn't afford to really invest in the heavy-duty kind of fax computers and things that people were getting. So all we could afford was off-the-shelf uh, consumer electronics, but it turned out that was the way it was going to go. That's sort of like the enigma of the personal computer. IBM didn't think the personal computer was going to be more than a toy for boys to list all the girls in high schools on the computer. Uh, but in fact, uh, they, they thought that's why they gave away the personal computer and the operating system to Microsoft, because they didn't think it was going to amount to anything. But in truth, that type of off-the-shelf electronics that we could afford really became the methodology of this new digital cinema. So all of those copy, Betamax copies of all the different cuts and all of the archival uh, library of every, every single uh, thing that we were doing, we preserved. And that's how we were able to go into it today even and be able to uh, work on these. Uh, but did you, did you have a sense why we were making an apocalypse today? this was something that we need to document? No, no. Or my no, attitude, this is just my, reflexive. My attitude towards apocalypse of is, oh my God, I'm never going to be able to survive this. The interest, the interest rates in those days was 26%. Imagine, I mean, today, what is it, 6%? That was, it was over 26%. And I think I owed about $30 million. I didn't have any kind of money like that at all. I just was on the hook for it. And, uh, and I was just so, you know, let's face it, I was scared. I had three, I had three kids, a uh, family, I had, I had just bought this beautiful wine estate which I thought was paradise and I said, and I was sure I was going to lose it. So, I, I, to really accurately say, I wasn't archiving anything except my own misery. I was <laughs> very, very frightened and very depressed. And what <laughs> In fact, the night, this is, Walter will bear me out, I think you'll remember this, the night we showed the movie this for the first time to all, all the distributors, that's sort of how I financed it, is I got each distributor around the world to put up a pledge that, oh, when, if we finished it, which is where the completion guarantee comes, that, oh, they would pay $3 million or whatever. So it all added up to enough to make the, 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 the money. But when they show it, the film was long and strange. And I remember I came back, all the team had worked so hard on it, and, and I went to them and I said, a good screenplay, we haven't got. A good movie, we haven't got. A good director, we haven't got. What do we got? Bum, bum. We've got hard. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, oh we went back in there and we cut out 12 minutes and we 
barely opened the, uh, well actually we didn't even open the picture. There were so many press stories saying what a disaster that the film would never open and it would, they were calling it Apocalypse When. <laughs> finally I did a very uh, uh, unusual thing is I got it accepted at the Cannes Film Festival as a work in progress. It wasn't finished. And my theory was that if at least we showed it, that they would stop saying we'd never finish it. And then, to my amazement, we won the, the along, uh, we shared the prize with Volker Schlerndorf and the Tin Drum, which was, a, which was a big shot in the arm, because just a few uh, weeks before, they were saying the film was a mess, it was never going to be cut together and stuff. And so I played this card of showing it at Cannes unfinished, after singing that heart song. <laughs> Do you remember that, Walter? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I don't know why I did that. It's a musical comedy kid in me. But uh, then the, the luck with the, the con gave us a little bit of momentum and we, 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 we did the opening. But, but uh, a lot of the things we did to shorten the movie, I think, really were truncated. So I put those back in, in this version tonight.